Today, we're diving into an epic story from ancient times, the Siege of Syracuse in 397 BC. This was the first of four major attempts by Carthage to take over the city of Syracuse, and let me tell you, it's a tale full of drama and intrigue. It all kicked off when Dionysius of Syracuse attacked Motia, which was a Carthaginian stronghold. Himoko, a Carthaginian leader, wasn't having any of that. So, he gathered a massive force and set sail for Sicily. After reclaiming Motia and establishing a new city called Lilibium, Himoko marched on Messana, sacking it before turning his sights on Syracuse in the fall of 397 BC. The Carthaginians used a clever strategy similar to one the Athenians had tried back in 415 BC, and it worked well at first. They managed to isolate Syracuse, cutting it off from outside help. But then, disaster struck. In the summer of 396 BC, a terrible plague swept through the Carthaginian camp, wiping out most of their troops. Seizing the moment, Dionysius launched a fierce land and sea attack. Himoko, realizing he was in a tough spot, struck a sneaky deal with Dionysius and managed to escape with the Carthaginian citizens. The Libyans left behind were enslaved, the Sicils vanished, and the Iberians decided to join Dionysius. With Carthage weakened by the plague, Dionysius started expanding his domain unchallenged until 393 BC. Let's backtrack a bit to understand the build-up to this siege. Carthage had invaded Sicily before, in 406 BC, to retaliate against Greek raids. Hannibal Mago, leading the charge, captured several cities, which eventually led to Dionysius becoming the ruler of Syracuse. A peace treaty was signed in 405 BC, leaving Carthage in control of most of Sicily while acknowledging Dionysius as the ruler of Syracuse. Dionysius didn't waste any time. Between 405 BC and 398 BC, he fortified Syracuse, built a massive army and fleet, and even created new weapons and ships. In 398 BC, he launched an attack on Motia, sparking a full-blown war with Carthage. The attack caused a rebellion among the Sicilian Greeks and Sicans. By the time Dionysius besieged Motia, only a few cities remained loyal to Carthage. Himoko tried to come to the rescue but failed, and Motia fell to Dionysius after fierce resistance. Himoko then regrouped, capturing several cities and eventually attacking Messana. Despite some initial successes, things took a turn for the worse when Mount Etna erupted, blocking their path. Meanwhile, Dionysius prepared Syracuse for the impending Carthaginian attack, even freeing slaves to man additional ships. In a crucial naval battle off Catena, the Greeks, led by Dionysius' brother, Leptins, suffered a devastating defeat. Over 20,000 soldiers and rowers were lost, and 100 ships were destroyed, forcing the surviving Greek fleet to retreat. After their initial success, the Carthaginian forces under Himoko set their sights on Syracuse with a formidable army of 50,000 men, 400 triremes, and 600 transports. However, by the time they reached Syracuse, their fleet had dwindled to 208 ships, though they still had 2,000 transports carrying essential supplies. Dionysius, on the other hand, had gathered a sizable force of 30,000 foot soldiers and 3,000 horsemen at Catena, along with 180 quinquerums. However, after the crushing defeat at the naval battle of Catena and the desertion of many allies, his naval strength had shrunk to just 80 ships. Determined to bolster his forces, Dionysius hired mercenaries and received additional soldiers from the population of Syracuse. Thirty triremes later joined him from Greece, giving a much-needed boost to his fleet. The Carthaginian army was a diverse mix. The Libyans, known for their discipline, supplied both heavy and light infantry. The heavy infantry, armed with long spears and round shields, fought in tight formations, while the light infantry carried javelins and small shields. Campanians, Sardinians, and Gauls, either in their native gear or equipped by Carthage, also bolstered the army. Sicils and other Sicilians fought like Greek hoplites, adding more variety to the Carthaginian ranks. 
The cavalry was equally impressive, with Libyan, Carthaginian, and Libyo-Phoenician units providing well-trained, disciplined horsemen equipped with thrusting spears and round shields. The Numidian cavalry, famed for their skill, rode without bridles or saddles, using bundles of javelins. Iberians and Gauls brought their own unique style of cavalry combat, relying on fierce all-out charges. Carthage also fielded heavy four-horse war chariots, though these had been largely lost when 50 of their transports were sunk by the Greeks off Eryx. The Carthaginian navy was primarily built around triremes, crewed by Carthaginian citizens and recruits from Libya and other Carthaginian territories. They had also captured several Greek quinquerums at Catena, though it's unclear if they were building these themselves at the time. The initial Carthaginian fleet at Syracuse included 208 warships and 3,000 transports. On the Greek side, the mainstay of Dionysius' army was the Hoplite, mainly drawn from citizens and bolstered by mercenaries from Italy and Greece. Native Sicilians, including Sicils, served as Hoplites and Peltasts, while some Campanians, likely equipped like Samnite or Etruscan warriors, also joined the ranks. The Greek phalanx formation was the standard, and in desperate times, Dionysius even considered using old men and women as peltasts. The cavalry came from wealthier citizens and mercenaries. The Greek navy, centered around the Quinquerum, an invention credited to Dionysius, also included triremes and various transport ships. The fleet was manned by citizen rowers. After the defeat at Catena, Dionysius faced a tough decision. With his fleet beaten, Mago could potentially dash straight to Syracuse. Dionysius initially wanted to confront Himoko's army directly, but his advisors pointed out the risk of Mago seizing Syracuse in their absence. So, he decided to retreat, breaking camp and marching south to Syracuse. Mother Nature lent a hand to the Greeks as worsening weather forced Mago to beach his ships, making them vulnerable. However, luck was on the Carthaginian side, as Dionysius had already started his retreat, with his remaining fleet sailing along the coast. The decision to face a siege was unpopular among Dionysius' allies, leading many to desert and return to their cities, manning the countryside castles in anticipation of the Carthaginians. Himoko's army reached Catena two days after the battle, ensuring the security of the Punic fleet. The Carthaginian forces took a few days to rest, repair damaged ships, and refit captured Greek vessels. Himoko also tried to persuade the Campanians at Etna to switch sides, but they remained loyal to Dionysius. As soon as Dionysius and the Greek army reached Syracuse, they began preparing for the inevitable Carthaginian siege. They fully manned and provisioned the forts around Leontini and Syracuse. Given the desertion of many Greek allies, Dionysius sent agents to hire mercenaries from Italy and Greece, particularly reaching out to Corinth, the mother city of Syracuse, and Sparta, a fellow Doric ally. His kinsman, Polyxanos, was also involved in this effort. The fortresses served dual purposes, protecting the harvest and acting as bases for harassing Carthaginian foragers, or serving as bait to draw the Carthaginian army away from Syracuse. These fortresses were meant to surrender easily and retain part of the Carthaginian forces' garrisons, buying Dionysius crucial time while Himoko dealt with them. However, Himoko ignored Leontini and the forts. His army slowly marched towards Syracuse, moving around the Epipoli Plateau and focusing on building their encampment. The Carthaginian war fleet, now consisting of 250 triremes and captured Greek quinquerums, sailed into the Great Harbor. In a show of strength, they sailed past Syracuse, displaying the spoils captured from the Greeks. Around 2,000 to 3,000 transports then moored in the harbor, bringing in additional soldiers and supplies, Himoko was ready to begin the siege. Meanwhile, the Syracusan navy, initially 180 ships strong but now reduced to 80 after the Battle of Catana, stayed in port. The fortifications of Syracuse were impressive. The original city stood on the island of Ortigia, with structures around the Agora on the mainland. 
During the Sicilian expedition in 415 BC, walls were built around the Tyca and Argdina areas. Dionysius had further fortified these structures, giving Syracuse the largest circuit of walls in the Greek world. The walls around Ortigia now surrounded the entire island, with a robust wall and towers at regular intervals along the isthmus connecting it to the mainland. This isthmus had docks on the west side and the small harbor, Laxius, on the east side. Laxius was enclosed by screens and walls and could accommodate 60 triremes, with a gate allowing one trireme to pass at a time. Two castles were built on Ortigia, one near the isthmus, which served as Dionysius's residence, and another further south. The isthmus itself had two walls, one separating the island from the isthmus and another separating the mainland from the isthmus. The Pentaplia, a series of five gates on the isthmus, controlled access between the mainland and Ortigia. Dionysius populated Ortigia with loyal mercenaries and close supporters. A massive castle with underground structures was built at Euryalos, guarding the main route to the plateau. He incorporated walls built during the Athenian expedition to settle people in Acredina. The stone walls around the plateau were between 2 and 4.5 meters thick and 6 meters high. Himoko chose to camp near the Great Harbor in the Palakana area, either north or south of the Anupis River. He took quarters at the Temple of Zeus, with the main camp likely situated on the marshy ground east of the temple and adjacent to Daskin Bay and the Lishmalia Marsh. The camp, including berthing facilities for the ships, was surrounded by a moat and palisade. Once the camp was set up, Himoko marched north and formed up for battle near the city. A hundred Carthaginian warships took positions on both sides of Ortigia, ready to counter any Greek ships that might attempt to sally forth. Despite the taunts of the Punic soldiers, the Greeks stayed within the walls of Syracuse. Himoko, not ready to assault the walls, unleashed his soldiers to strip the land of all possible supplies. For thirty days they ravaged the area, likely hoping to intimidate the Greeks into surrendering before winter. When this failed, the Carthaginians settled into winter quarters and began preparations for a prolonged siege and the Carthaginians now began preparing for a full-scale siege. Himoko built a fort near the Temple of Zeus, although it is unclear if the temple was inside the fort. Another fort was constructed at Daskin and one at Plemirian to safeguard the main camp and provide safer anchorage for the ships. The main camp itself was surrounded by a regular wall, in addition to the existing moat and palisade. In the process, the tombs of Gelen and his wife were demolished to make way for the new fortifications. Part of the Carthaginian fleet was dispersed, while transport ships were sent to Sardinia and Africa to bring in more provisions. The forts were stocked with wine, corn, and all necessary supplies, with Himoko sparing no expense to ensure his soldiers' needs were met. The Carthaginians had a history of successfully besieging Greek cities, in 409 BC, they had stormed Selinus using siege engines and captured Himera the same year. In 406 BC, they besieged Acragas by encamping on both sides of the city. However, the size of the Syracusan defenses made building a circumvallation wall impractical. Himoko either wanted to keep his forces concentrated or lacked the numbers to surround Syracuse completely. Building another camp would have exposed the Carthaginians to sudden attacks from the Greeks inside Syracuse or a relief force without the protection of circumvallation walls. A direct assault on the southern side would expose the attackers to a flank attack from the fort at Euryalos. The height of the walls on top of the plateau made it almost impossible to assault without building siege ramps. Himoko adopted a strategy similar to the Athenian leader Nicias in 415 BC. He stayed put and awaited favorable developments inside Syracuse. After completing his preparations, he went into winter quarters. While Syracuse was under siege, it was not fully cut off, and Greek ships could still sail in and out of the Laxius harbor unless challenged by Punic ships. During the winter of 397 BC, both sides played a waiting game from their respective positions. In the spring of 396 BC, 
Himoko began attacking the suburbs of Syracuse. There is no record of the Carthaginians breaching the city walls, but they captured a section of the city containing several temples, including one dedicated to Demeter and Kor, which they plundered. Dionysius also acted aggressively, sending out sorties to attack Carthaginian patrols and winning several skirmishes, but the overall tactical situation remained unchanged. Meanwhile, Polyxanos had managed to gather a naval squadron in Greece. Under the command of Pharaochides of Sparta, 30 triremes reached Syracuse. The Spartan had captured several Punic ships, and the Carthaginian blockade ships had mistakenly allowed his ships through, thinking a Punic squadron was returning from patrol. Both the Greeks and the Carthaginians now depended on overseas supplies to sustain their efforts. Shortly after this, Dionysius and his brother Leptins sailed out with a flotilla to escort a crucial supply convoy for Syracuse. During their absence, the Syracusans scored a significant success. After spotting an unescorted Punic corn ship in the Great Harbor, five Syracusan ships sailed out and captured it. While the prize was being brought in, 40 Punic ships sailed out, prompting the entire Syracusan navy to engage the Punic squadron. They sank four ships and captured 20, including the flagship. The Greek ships then advanced on the main Punic anchorage, but the Carthaginians declined to engage. The Greeks returned to Syracuse with their spoils. This success was achieved without Dionysius's leadership. Upon his return, some of his political enemies tried to depose him during a citizen's assembly. However, the Spartans refused to support the dissenters, causing the coup attempt to collapse. As summer arrived in Sicily in 396 BC, the strategic situation remained unchanged. Himoko had not managed to capture Syracuse, and Dionysius had not defeated the Carthaginian forces. Both sides were heavily reliant on overseas supplies. At this critical juncture, a plague broke out among the Carthaginian troops who had been suffering from the intense heat. The plague, reminiscent of the Athenian plague, may have been caused by poor hygiene in the marshy grounds and possibly malaria. The result was catastrophic. Scores of soldiers and sailors died, burial parties were overwhelmed, bodies were hastily buried, and the stench of decaying bodies filled the air. Fear of infection prevented proper care for the sick. Many attributed this calamity to the desecration of Greek temples and tombs. Himoko, who had faced a similar situation at Akragas in 406 BC, had previously sacrificed a child and animals to appease the gods. However, any measures he took at Syracuse proved ineffective, the Punic forces were decimated, and the fleet's readiness diminished. Despite the plague, Himoko and his troops stubbornly held their ground, but morale plummeted. Dionysius saw an opportunity to strike while the Carthaginians were weakened. He planned a combined land and sea attack on the Punic forces before they could recover or receive reinforcements. He ordered 80 ships to be manned, with Leptins and Pharaochides commanding the naval attack on the Punic ships beached at the Bay of Daskin. Dionysius himself would lead the soldiers in an attack on the Punic camp. He planned to march his army on a moonless night in a roundabout way to the Temple of Cyan and attack the Carthaginian fortifications at first light, with the Greek fleet attacking after he had engaged the Carthaginians. The success of this plan hinged on precise coordination between the fleet and the army. Dionysius successfully completed his night march and reached Cyan. At daybreak, he sent his cavalry and 1,000 mercenaries to attack the camp directly from the west as a diversion. Dionysius had secretly ordered his horsemen to abandon the mercenaries once they engaged the Carthaginians. The combined force attacked the camp, and the mercenaries were slaughtered when the Greek horsemen suddenly fled. This maneuver distracted the enemy and rid Dionysius of unreliable soldiers. While the mercenaries were being butchered, the main Greek army launched attacks on the forts near the Temple of Zeus at Polycana and Daskin. The cavalry, after deserting the mercenaries, joined the attack on Daskin, while part of the Greek fleet attacked the Punic ships beached nearby. The Carthaginians were caught by surprise, and before they could mount a coordinated defense, 
Dionysius had defeated the force outside the camp and stormed the fort at Palacana. The Greek forces then attacked the Carthaginian camp and the temple, but the Carthaginians held them off until nightfall. The Punic fleet, already undermanned due to the plague, was further weakened by the surprise attack. Many ships were deserted, and the Greek ships, achieving total surprise, rammed and sank some of the Punic ships at anchor, boarded and captured others, and set fire to some, causing them to drift away. The Punic soldiers and sailors leapt into the water to swim ashore. The fire spread to the camp but was eventually put out after part of it burned. The Punic army, busy fending off the Greek soldiers, could not offer assistance. Some Greeks manned merchant vessels and boats, towed derelict Punic ships away, and scavenged whatever spoils they could find. The fort at Daskin also fell into Greek hands. Dionysius then encamped his army near the Temple of Zeus at Palacana, and the fleet returned to Syracuse. Despite capturing the forts at Palacana and Daskin, the Punic camp and the Temple of Zeus remained in Carthaginian hands, and a substantial part of their fleet survived. The initiative now lay with Dionysius, and unless Himoko acted to avert it, a disaster comparable to the one at Himera could befall the Carthaginians. Himoko, realizing the dire situation, opted to open secret negotiations with Dionysius that night, keeping other Greek commanders in the dark, as the Italian and mainland Greek contingents favored completely destroying the Punic forces. Dionysius was also ready to make a deal, needing the threat of Carthage to maintain control over the citizens of Syracuse. He responded to Himoko's overtures but refused to let the Carthaginians simply sail away. After some haggling, they agreed on these terms. The Carthaginians would pay Dionysius 300 talents immediately, Himoko could depart with the Carthaginian citizens unmolested at night, but Dionysius could not guarantee their safety during the day, and the Carthaginian departure would take place on the fourth night. Himoko secretly sent 300 talents to either the fort at Palacana or Syracuse. Dionysius withdrew his army to Syracuse, and on the appointed night, Himoko manned 40 ships with Carthaginian citizens and sailed away. As this fleet passed the Great Harbor Mouth, the Corinthians spotted them and informed Dionysius. Dionysius made a great show of arming his fleet but delayed calling his officers to give Himoko time to escape. Unaware of the secret pact, the Corinthians manned their ships and managed to sink a few laggards, but most of the Carthaginian ships escaped to Africa. After Himoko's departure, Dionysius marshaled his army and approached the Carthaginian camp. By this time, the Sicils had slipped away to their homes, and most of the remaining Punic soldiers surrendered. Some soldiers trying to flee were captured by the Greeks. The Iberians, ready to resist, were hired by Dionysius for his own army. The rest of the Punic prisoners were enslaved. Dionysius did not immediately march against the Punic possessions in Sicily, but took time to consolidate his realm. He likely did not want to provoke Carthage more than necessary. The Sicilian Greek cities, having thrown off Carthaginian overlordship, were now more or less friendly with Syracuse. Solus was betrayed and sacked in 396 BC. Later, 10,000 mercenaries of Dionysius revolted after he arrested their commander, Aristoteles of Sparta, and were placated only after their leader was sent to Sparta for judgment, and the mercenaries received the city of Leontini to rule. Dionysius then repopulated the ruined city of Messana with colonists from Italy and mainland Dorian Greeks, and founded Tyndarus with the original inhabitants of Messana, who had been driven out after the Carthaginian sack of their city in 397 BC. In 394 BC, Dionysius unsuccessfully besieged Tormenium, held by Sicils allied to Carthage. In response, Mago of Carthage led an army to Messana in 393 BC, renewing the war. Himoko's return to Carthage after abandoning his troops did not sit well with the Carthaginian citizens or their African subjects. Although the Council of 104 did not crucify him, Himuko took full responsibility for the debacle. 
He visited all the city's temples dressed in rags, pleaded for deliverance, and finally bricked himself inside his house, starving himself to death. Despite sacrifices to placate the Carthaginian gods, a plague swept through Africa, weakening Carthage. The Libyans, angered by the desertion of their kinsmen, rebelled, gathering an army of 70,000 and besieging Carthage. Mago, the victor of Catena, took command. The standing Punic army was in Sicily, and recruiting a new one was time-consuming and costly, so he rallied Carthaginian citizens to man the walls while the Punic navy supplied the city. Mago used bribes and other means to quell the rebels. Carthaginians built a temple for Demeter and Kor in the city, having Greeks offer proper sacrifices to atone for the temple's destruction at Syracuse. Mago moved to Sicily but did not try to recover lost territory. Instead, he adopted a policy of cooperation and friendship, aiding Greeks, Sicans, Sicils, Elimians, and Punics, regardless of prior standings with Carthage. Greek cities, having thrown off Carthaginian overlordship, moved from a pro-Syracuse stance to a more neutral one, feeling threatened by Dionysius or influenced by Mago's activities. This peaceful policy continued until Dionysius attacked the Sicils in 394 BC.